Um, welcome back. Thank you, everybody, uh, for our third panel on free speech, libel, and privacy in the Internet age, or as, as, uh, as Eugene coined it, cheap speech and the transformation of American law. Our first speaker, uh, who authored a paper for this, I recommend uh, you take a look at it. It's on the event's website, is Eugene Volokh. He is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA. He's one of the nation's leading First Amendment scholars, author of a major casebook on the First Amendment and myriad articles. And he is famously the founder of one of the nation's leading legal blogs, The Volokh Conspiracy. Eugene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, great pleasure to be here, and in particular to be able to present this paper, because I'm still working on it. Actually, it'll probably end up becoming four different papers. Uh, and I would love to hear feedback on all aspects of it. Because uh, this is one of those subjects which I think is quite difficult. I, I don't know what the right answer is. Much of what I'm going to be trying to do here is to present what I see as actually going on, which very much surprised me and I thought might surprise many of you. Um, when we think of libel, we still, I think the first case that comes to mind probably is New York Times v. Sullivan. If you had to look at another case, maybe Gertz v. Robert Welch. Uh, look at another one, maybe Dunn and Bradstreet v. Green Moss Builders. Uh, lawsuits that were brought against basically institutional media or other such speakers. Uh, you probably don't think of Johnny Cochran, and you don't think of Ulysses Torrey. I, his picture should be up here, but I don't have a picture of Ulysses Torrey. He's a little guy. He's a little guy who uh, started picketing outside of Johnny Cochran's office. Uh, and Johnny Cochran's claim was this was basically an attempt to extort money from, uh, uh, from uh, Cochran. Cochran, but in any event, uh, it is a, was a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court on the question whether you could have an injunction against allegedly libelous speech. And then Johnny Cochran died. And for reasons having to do with particular features of libel law, that basically made the case go away. So my claim is that Cochran and Tory are much more the face of modern libel law in many ways than New York Times v. Sullivan. And that has had consequences to the way that libel law actually operates on the ground, makes it sharply different from the way that uh, we have long understood it. And by we, I very much include myself. Um, so traditionally, if you wanted to ask what the remedy structure of libel law, not the substantive rules about when actual malice is required and the like, uh, those have been settled um, uh, pretty much uh, since around 1992. That was the last substantive libel case the Supreme Court heard. But if you wanted to look at the remedies, here's conventional wisdom. Civil damages, some dispute about whether punitive, presumed compensatory damage is available. No injunctions, after all, that would be a prior restraint. Long-standing rule in American law since the 1830s, at least, that there can be no injunctions in libel cases. Partly for remedies uh, principles, equity will not enjoin a libel, and partly for free speech principles. Criminal libel and near desuetude. This is what was written in the 1960s by the American Law Institute, which concluded that model penal code should not, uh, uh, should not uh, have a provision for criminal libel. And the thought was that if anything, it had fallen e even more into disuse since then. And if you think about it, this is a scheme that works in some measure for lawsuits brought by people with money versus people, without, uh, people who also have money. Because after all, if the defendant has money, then in that case, he's got some money to go after and may also be deterred by the risk of losing the money. And the plaintiff has money, he can hire a lawyer to go and shepherd this whole process through the system. Now, what about people without money versus people with money? It's always better to have money. Uh, but even if you don't have money, you might still be able to sue somebody if you've got a very, very good case, somebody with money. Because after all, there's the prospect of recovery that might lead, in principle, a lawyer to take the case for you. Maybe quite hard for public figure cases where um, actual malice is seen as a very high bar. But maybe for private figure cases uh, uh, where compensatory damages can be found based on mere negligence, at least in principle, you might get that. But what about lawsuits about people with money versus people without? Well, they can afford a lawyer, but people with money usually have money in part because they don't just throw it away. And that's what it would be if you sue somebody who doesn't have money and all you're asking for is damages. What's the point? Uh, and if you don't have any money and you're trying to sue somebody who doesn't have any money, uh, there's really the, the, the existing system uh, has no meaning for you. 
Uh, so what have the consequences been? Well, it used to be that this model was fit also the reality of mass media publications, which is if you didn't have money, you weren't speaking in the mass media because you didn't own a newspaper, you didn't own a radio station, you couldn't buy space on billboards because you didn't have any money. And, unle and unless you had the ear of somebody who did have money, like you're a journalist, you wouldn't, uh, um, you wouldn't be able to speak. What's more, because a newspaper is liable for things printed in its pages, including letters to the editor, even if it publishes a letter from somebody who doesn't have any money, they will be liable and they do have money. Maybe not a lot, but some, and they have insurance policies and such which substitute in this respect. But now that the internet has come around and people without money can speak and often speak in ways that are easily findable on Google, if you search for somebody's name, you can see all sorts of things posted <laughs> about them. Um, uh, and there's no liability because 47 U.S.C. Section 230, no ability for the moneyed intermediaries. This system is not, doesn't really work. Doesn't work for small businesses who claim, perhaps correctly, that they've been libeled online on sites like ripoffreport.com. Doesn't work for individuals who are who were libeled on what they see as purely personal matters. Uh, one, uh, there's a website I like because of its very self-descriptive name. It's called she'sahomewrecker.com. And you can gather what kind of material <laughs> is posted on that site. And some of it may be true and some of it may be false. But the bottom line is that the posters don't have any money and neither, do, neither is the subject. So libel law basically under this um, rem remedial scheme is meaningless in those situations. Uh, so what is the consequence? The first consequence that has surprised me is the survival of criminal libel law. There are about 20 criminal libel cases per year throughout the country and about a dozen states that still have them. Now that's not a vast number, but I had thought the, the number was zero. And in fact, virtually none of them end up coming to the appellate courts. Uh, but if you look, if you ask, <coughs> excuse me, either search records or what I've done is sometimes just send public records requests uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to state court systems and state uh, uh, bureaus of investigation, you find that that's about what's happening. And, I, as I, and my sense is while some of them really are kind of political, politically motivated ones, there are two uh, such incidents in Louisiana in recent years, I think a lot of them is just the prosecutor feeling there is this person who doesn't have any money, who can't hire a lawyer, and he's been libeled, or she's been libeled often, that it does, has a sexual dimension, by somebody who also doesn't have any money. I'm the lawyer. I am the lawyer for the people, which includes this person. I'm not going to represent them civilly, but I'm going to see that justice is done for somebody who can't afford to get it done uh, by hiring a lawyer. Um, I was involved in a, a challenge to a Minnesota criminal libel statute, which actually did not provide truth as a complete defense. That was our challenge. The statute was struck down. But unlike many such statutes in the past that have been struck down, which the result was no more statute, the Minnesota legislature promptly reenacted it in a way that's constitutionally permissible because it provided truth, uh, uh, it provided a requirement that, that uh, be shown to be false, beyond reasonable doubt. But they seemed quite interested in this. California courts are reinventing criminal libel. There's a statute which is actually called colloquially the identity theft statute, which was understood for a long time as just being about identity theft, but is actually written broadly enough to make it a crime to use somebody's identifying information, which includes their name, for unlawful purposes, which courts have said includes tortious purposes. So in intentionally libeling someone in California is a crime, and courts are actually reinventing libel law this way. Hara so-called harassment statutes, criminal harassment statutes, are being deployed as criminal libel laws. They don't actually even require a showing of falsehood. They require a showing of intent to annoy or embarrass, and often uh, have a provision that, that, that they don't apply to constitutionally protected speech, but of course libel is not constitutionally protected. So without any real deliberation, uh, at least at the legislative level in those statutes, uh, um, about whether they should be applied to libel law. This has happened, and I think in part, rightly or wrongly, and I think as to harassment statutes, I think it's very much wrongly, but it has happened because of the sense among prosecutors and judges that, again, the, criminal, the civil libel law system is meaningless, and if there is to be justice, it has to be had this way. Uh, uh, now, what about injunctions? Injunctions are commonplace. And my guess is hundreds a year, at least, that I've seen myself uh, probably many more that are not easily visible. 
Now, some of them are clearly unconstitutional, although the very fact that they're out there sort of shows the appetite among courts for doing these things. Defendant is permanently enjoined from publishing any statements whatsoever with regard to plaintiff, not just libelous ones, any, or shall not pub publish any further defamatory false statements regarding plaintiffs. That's a narrower provision. And sometimes there are ones that are actually quite narrow indeed. Defendant is permanently enjoined from ascribing conduct to plaintiff that implies he ever sexually abused anyone under 18 years of age, based on a judgment by the court that in fact those allegations were false. But note all of these, in principle, at least as I understood it, and by, at least in the view of many courts, uh, uh, would be unconstitutional. I still think the first one is clearly unconstitutional, but quite a few courts have been willing to accept those, and there it is, including appellate courts. And one thing that's going on here, in addition to this, uh, uh, to what, what we were talking about before, is traditional print defamation. It was almost pointless to enjoin but defamation in a newspaper, because newspapers usually weren't writing again and again about something. They wrote something, at that point it's out, and, uh, and uh, nothing left to enjoin, really. Uh, that was a short, sharp shock model of reputation damage. But with internet defamation, there's persistent damage. What's happening is every time somebody's name comes up in a Google search result, uh, the searcher sees these accusations. Um, uh, so, in fact, as a result, quite a few courts, starting before the internet era, but I think it's accelerated recently, uh, have actually said that it's okay uh, to issue such permanent injunctions, at least following uh, a trial saying that speech is defamatory. Pennsylvania, some years ago, said no. Some decades ago, said no. Texas actually tries to split the difference. Now, one might say, okay, well, that's interesting, uh, but at least that's a civil remedy. Remember, the whole point of an injunction is it is that it criminalizes what is otherwise would be just tortious conduct, the crime being contempt of court. An injunction against libel is like a little criminal libel law, just for you and just for me. If it enjoins me from libeling you, it's like it's a crime for me, it was a crime for me, to libel you. Now, it's not as broadly restrictive because it doesn't apply to everybody, it doesn't apply to all subjects. Nonetheless, it is, it is a form of criminalizing, um, uh, uh, criminalizing libelous. Then there's also Google as enforcer, sure. And uh, I'll close with this, but uh, I, I like to close on a lurid note. Um, uh, and uh, one minute. Uh, for, uh, so Google as enforcer, um, uh, uh, this, the other, the, the third model that is out there, the theory being, look, e even getting an injunction uh, is something that may not be that effective. What if the defendant's anonymous or outside jurisdiction or unable to take down post? What if the defendant's dead? So you just send the... Uh, order to Google and say, look, Google, we are not bound by this order. You're immune from liability under 47 U.S.C. Section 230. You were never named in the lawsuit, but would you please, pretty please, do the right thing and de-index this thing that a court has found to be, um, to be defamatory. And that sounds like a great remedy. But the problem is that Google is being asked to do this without actually knowing what the proceeding was like. Um, so here's an example of a Harris County, Texas order. And looks quite legit. It's a real order. There's a stipulation that's the basis for the order. The defendant actually admitted that the statement was false. It's notarized. It's notarized in Sacramento, California, even though the defendant supposedly lives in Harris County. You know, that happens. I've had my signature notarized when I was traveling. But what are the chances of it happening a dozen times hmm. in Harris County courts, all uh, defendants, all of whom uh, signatures were notarized in California, which is exactly what I saw. And in fact, the Texas AG's office has now gone after a so-called reputation management company for ginning up these lawsuits where defendants admitted to uh, posting things that clearly they had nothing whatsoever to do with just to get this order to go to Google. Uh, well, what about this one? This is a federal district court, Bradley Smith versus Deborah Garcia. The problem is that here, there actually is not even a defendant. Deborah Garcia doesn't exist, as best we can tell. There's an address given for her. There is no Deborah Garcia associated with that address. Now, records are notoriously imprecise. Maybe there's a typo there. Found 25 cases that have similar boilerplate, 15 of which include uh, the defendant's address, none of which is, does the defendant appear to exist there. And in fact, actually, another reputation management company was sanctioned to the tunes of tens of thousands of dollars for filing these lawsuits. Well, here's another example. This is a, a lawsuit. And it's interesting to try to figure out if Krista Evansky actually is really out there. 
But interestingly, Samantha Pierce, the notary, doesn't exist. And unsurprisingly, given that her notary ID is 2012, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. <laughs> uh, so this is a fake notarization. If you're, but if you really are, uh, want something, how about an outright fake order? I found 70 forged court orders that have been submitted to Google. Uh, now, uh, some of, so part of this is that any successful system generates parasites. That's sort of, that's a fact of biology, it's a fact of society. But one of the consequences, what I'm seeing here, is every time we try to do something about libel, a real, real problem out there, there are huge problems, especially in this era of cheap speech. You try to use traditional remedies, they are pointless when the defendant doesn't have money. The alternative of, uh, that is happening is a revival of criminal libel law, but there are obvious hazards with criminal libel as well. Then you might have injunctions that are issued, but some of them are vastly overbroad, and others, even if they are suitably narrow, they still have the, pose the same uh, criminal libel problems. Maybe on balance we ought to keep them, but, uh, uh, but again, I think we have to recognize that they, pose, that, that they are potentially dangerous. And then, when it looks like we have a solution, public-private partnership, right? Sounds good, civic-minded uh, corporations taking advantage of information generated through the court system to, uh, to try to protect in, uh, people who've been victimized by reputation. The consequence has been, all in all, between the forgeries and the fake stuff and such, well over 100 at least uh, uh, outright frauds that people have been trying to, per to perpetrate, plus who knows how many others that just haven't been, there's no smoking gun that shows that they're fraudulent. So this is the problem. I don't know the solution. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Our next speaker is Mike Godwin. He is a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute, where he continues his career work as one of the nation's leading experts on law and technology. Previously, he was general counsel for the Wikimedia Foundation. That is the foundation that operates Wikipedia. In the 1990s, before many people had even heard of the internet, uh, Mike was the first staff counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, uh, how much time have I got here? About 10 minutes. Okay, I'm actually going to try to ex impose some uh, internal discipline and do a, now I'm starting the stopwatch. Reason is, you know, uh, normally in a, in a well-ordered society, the administrative state would step in and tell me when I was done, but since we don't have that here, uh, I'm going to uh, use the stopwatch. And there, I've now lost 20 seconds. So. Uh, let me just walk through my, uh, my, I have a number of observations, uh, but I want to I, I shine some historical perspective since uh, Adam has carefully introduced me as uh, distinguished, which is old. Uh, uh, that, but some historical perspective on how some of the cheap speech issues that, uh, that uh, Eugene talked about uh, more than 20 years ago and that I talked about more than 20 years ago and that have resurfaced in a world of of kind of generalized cheap speech where you can do all sorts of torts to other people on the internet. I want to, I want to shine a little bit of uh, historical light because I think that informs this, this discussion. Uh, I, I know that in the first, when I first uh, came on at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, it was not at all clear that uh, internet speech or computer speech would be understood to be strongly protected by the First Amendment. And so the first years of my career as a lawyer were about you know, winning that public uh, debate, winning uh, the important cases, including Reno versus ACLU, uh, and uh, winning Section 230, uh, negotiating the provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and so on, which were all really aimed at uh, recognizing that we had this huge democratic, uh, a hugely enabling uh, new medium in the internet, uh, and we didn't want it to get channeled into kind of the traditional media models, where the traditional media models are you have a highly capitalized newspaper or radio station, uh, but which is, uh, has money to defend itself, but also which is a useful choke point for censorship if you want to shut something down. Uh, historically, if you wanted to shut a newspaper down, you know who to sue. They have one set of lawyers or maybe a bunch of lawyers, but you know what town they're in and so on. But with internet speech, you can sue people. It doesn't matter. They're judgment proof a lot of the time. Or maybe uh, you've been defamed or you've been hurt in other ways and you can't possibly uh, use uh, 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 libel law or any other information toward as a remedy. Now, uh, one of the things that I, 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 we worked very hard on in the 1990s was to establish sort of the First Amendment presumption about the Internet, and I think we succeeded in that. 
Uh, and we also anticipated, and I want to be really clear about this, Eugene and I and other people who are writing about this issue absolutely recognize that one of the hazards that would be out there was, w is that the internet enabled cheap speech would enable people to engage not only in defamation, and Eugene focuses uh, appropriately on, on libel, which is really a kind of an interesting case, uh, but also on uh, all the privacy torts, as we understand them, which are intrusion upon seclusion, false light, misrepresentation, publication of embarrassing private facts, and misappropriation of name or likeness. I'm glad I can do that uh, off the top of my head. Um, but uh, uh, all of those things can happen cheaply over the Internet, and they're hard to remedy because uh, uh, you, you don't have the remedy, you don't have the, you typically don't have the resources to sue somebody who's done this to you. And this is a, really an issue, right? Because many, many people have found that embarrassing photographs of them may be taken by other people. So the copyright sits somewhere else, have, have been published. Uh, publication of embarrassing private facts. If a newspaper does it, they get sued and you can get that stuff pulled down. Although we have uh, a very reactive internet. So everybody, you know the Streisand effect, which is that the minute you sue to get the embarrassing information taken down, a hundred flowers bloom, really thousands of flowers bloom where they're gonna republish that stuff because they hate it when people on the internet get sued. Other people hate it on the internet get sued. So that's kind of a very interesting uh, anti-litigation culture that's sort of grown up on the internet and that's kind of interesting, but it's still problematic because you may actually have real damage to your privacy and reputation and this is something that we have to grapple with. Well. How do we grapple with it? In the 1990s, uh, you know, we, the way we talked about it and the way the uh, decisions that led up to Reno versus ACLU, the Supreme Court case in 1997 that established First Amendment protection for the internet was, uh, was you know, we said let, you know, we, we said there's gonna be a lot of diversity of sources and it's the freest medium of expression uh, protected. It ought to be protected by the First Amendment. I think all that stuff is still true, but we imagined a multiplicity of platforms and voices and I think the thing that none of us really quite anticipated was that uh, largely due to, and there's no good reason for us not to have anticipated it, which is that largely due to market competition and other things, there, sometimes there's a shakeout in platforms. There's a, sh you know, there are shakeouts, shakeouts in search, which leave only one or two or three companies doing uh, internet search. There are shakeout in social media platforms of various kinds of which Facebook is a, is a current winner, uh, certainly in the, in the Western democracies, uh, other social media platforms are winners in other kinds of uh, governments and other kinds of regulatory regimes, but there are winners so that if you, if somebody decides to uh, libel you or to explode your privacy, uh, uh, they can just pick one platform and massively reach pretty much everybody else who uses the platform. And, uh, and, and, and in a country where the remedies are sort of limited to either the existing legal remedies in the court system or, uh, or they're limited to being heard, uh, you, ha you may have uh, a problem, and, and, a, and a number of critics, uh, and I think those of you who watch this stuff on social media platforms, you know that this is true, which is that uh, certainly if there was not a moral panic about social media prior to the 2016 elections, there definitely is a panic about social media platforms after the 2016 elections, because for a lot of people, if the elections did not turn out the way they expected or the way it was predicted, it must mean that there's a single expectation explanatory reason, and the single explanatory reason could be uh, fake news promulgated on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, I've written about this for Cato Unbound most recently and a colloquy on Cato Unbound, but, uh, but you can see it else, you know, elsewhere. Uh, I read, it's impossible to keep track of the articles that express the idea that there's something wrong with Facebook or something wrong with Twitter or something wrong with Google because of the spread of fake news or because uh, they're politically polarizing. That's another argument that's frequently offered. Um, you know, if you ha take a historical view, one of the things you discover is amazingly, long before the internet, people often reinforced each other's ideas when they were living in uh, different pockets and different communities. They often had pretty noxious ideas that they reinforced among each other, and this often led to polarized politics. Uh, so, you know, anyone with a historical perspective on this has to say there's something different in the internet era that maybe needs to be remedied, and I think that's a hard case to make. But having said that, I think I, I think I made a winning argument that we should be skeptical, but it doesn't matter what I think because the fact is we're still in the midst of a moral panic and we're still gonna see lots of articles that call for regulation of Facebook or Google or Twitter or you know, in the European Union, uh, those of you who follow the European Union, there's immense 
uh, immense multiple sources of impulses to regulate uh, and censor. Some of them have to do with uh, right to be forgotten. Others have to do with various versions of, of the European versions of the privacy uh, uh, torts, which are much more expansive and, and, and sort of written into kind of the natural rights language of the rights instruments of European Union. So um, these are all problems that are out there. And uh, I, I want to I maybe take how much, how many more minutes do I have? I have like two minutes. Uh, so I've been trying to think about what some possible solutions are. We can, I can expand on any of these topics, but one set of solutions uh, that might be worth exploring is can you have kind of a fast track, you know, a fast track small claims or some kind of fast track uh, uh, judicial process or governmental process where your claim that you were defamed or that your privacy was invaded could be quickly adjudicated at relatively low cost. Now, we actually have some things kind of like this in the internet realm, notably notice and takedown and copyright. Uh, we also have, uh, a, you know, domain, we have a domain name process that's really aimed at uh, trademark protection. It sort of allows you to sidestep a lot of trademark litigation if somebody's uh, using your trademark uh, to uh, hijack a domain name. So we have, you know, very narrow solutions in some very narrow domains. Maybe we could do something like that with regard to reputation and privacy. Uh, or, and I just sort of, I have two more solutions, so I'm going to oh, go this. The, the, the next solution, uh, maybe there's, maybe we could create, we could privatize forums so that you could actually, maybe we don't want to burden government with it to do this because that just takes the externalities and costs and puts them on government and other taxpayers who may not care if you are able to do that or not. But maybe you could, if you know you've been defamed, you could uh, uh, hire a private tribunal and a private tribunal would succeed in, with, in, his, in his professional reputation if it was fair. You know, and then they might say, oh, well, you know, they said this about Mike Godwin, but Mike Godwin pursued uh, a formal claim and we took in all the facts that we could find and we asked everybody who was willing to talk to us and it turns out that it's false. Maybe that's a solution. But here's the best solution. The best solution is a libel service. So what is a libel service? You hire the libel service and you're a subscriber. So I'm Mike Godwin, I subscribe to the libel service and I pay them to say bad things about me on the internet. <laughs> I just pay them to ba say bad things about me on the internet. And they say it, you know, they try to publish something every day. If I have a premium service, maybe two things, five things every day that are really bad about me. So that when anybody finds something bad about me, I said, oh yeah, that's my service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my service, they do a good job. So that, I'm just putting that out there. That's sort of my, uh, that's my most elegant solution to the problem, and I'm happy to explore any of these. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so fake news is the solution to the problem exactly. this time. Great, thanks. All right, our third speaker is Andrew McLaughlin. Now, in trying to formulate an introduction for Andrew, it was difficult because evidently he's done everything. Uh, so I went to his website to see where to start, and I liked this line. He just, his website describes him as Andrew McLaughlin is a nerd who digs the internet, startups, product design, entrepreneurship, politics, public policy, civic tech, free speech, media innovation, rule of law, economic opportunity, and functional democratic institutions. That's pretty good. Just when, a, just a nerd, specific, basically. Yeah. Um, he's executive director of Yale's um, Psi Center for Innovative Thinking, uh, as well as co-founder of Higher Ground Labs and a partner of Betaworks. Previously served in the Obama White House as deputy chief technology officer of the United States. Uh, as Director of Global Public Policy at Google. Um, and I might add, you've been CEO of my favorite app, Instapaper. Ah. So thank you very much. You're right welcome. on. Thanks for the four bucks. <laughs> it's well, well worth it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, I just want to say, like, Mike, if I can now get paid for libeling you instead of doing this unpaid labor mm, on your behalf, right. I am into it. Ooh, you can start sending the checks. So what I'm going to do today is basically just try to drop two uh, bits of bloody chum in the waters here. Um, one, I want to bring a perspective of kind of international uh, approaches to this perceived mismatch between cheap speech, uh, the, the instruments of uh, redress for uh, intentional falsehood in a world of cheap speech and platform immunity. Um, and then the second one is I want to talk a little bit about the platform perspective. So, um, so first of all, um, uh, this was an excuse for me to reread Eugene's paper from 1995, and if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. It is an amazingly foresight, uh, foresightful, insightful, prescient, prescient piece um, about uh, what the democratization of the power to speak um, is going to bring. Both the economics and the political dimensions are covered in this piece. You raise a bunch of questions, you actually venture, I think, maybe a couple of tentative wrong answers, but the piece is uh, terrific and, uh, and well worth a read. Um, Just really quick, what's the title of the paper? Cheap Speech and What It Will Do. There we go. 
cheap speech and what it will do. Right. And the working title of your conglomerated paper now is What Cheap Speech Has Done. What Cheap Speech Has Done. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, uh, the, um, the, uh, the thing that I uh, uh, am struck by at a pretty high level is A, how great it is to see somebody go in and do empirical digging through very often difficult to find resources, extract patterns and tell a story about how law is being made from the bottom up in a world where the broader architectures of law and policy are seen as inadequate to the times, inadequate to the moment. Um, very cool to see that uh, kind of archaeology uh, of legal materials being done. Um, and so for me then, this interesting question uh, uh, confronts all of us, which is, if you believe that uh, knowing an intentional uh, 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 false speech is a problem, um, and you believe that we're not going to go back to an era of large media controllers, we're going to have a, a universe of many individual speakers, uh, many of whom will take advantage of the opportunity to engage in libel or defamation, um, and we've got a legal rule which basically says that the carriers of the speech uh, are immunized uh, from any real responsibility to deal with it, then what is the solution? And what Eugene has identified is a whole bunch of lower courts using instruments of criminal libel, analogous effective criminal libel, uh, injunctions that either flow from that or again are analogous uh, to uh, criminal libel injunctions. Um, and I want to point out sort of two other ways in which people are trying to tackle the same uh, perceived deficiency. So one is uh, international. And so uh, the obvious sort of um, non-US uh, effort at the moment uh, that Mike alluded to is what's called uh, the Netzdege, or the um, internet enforcement, the network enforcement law in Germany. It's just come into force at the beginning of January. Um, and it is Germany's attempt to say that for 20 categories of speech that is prohibitable under the German constitution, uh, the platforms, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, um, are obligated to uh, uh, take down speech, which is, it's a little hard to know exactly how to translate the German word, but manifestly unlawful, obviously unlawful would probably be pretty good translations. Um, and so uh, as a result, uh, the platforms have to respond to notices, uh, many of whom we, we should assume are uh, legitimate, but many of, whom are, uh, many of which uh, are legitimate, many of which are probably also tactical or fraudulent in the ways that Eugene pointed out uh, you can see in the lower courts in the US. And the platforms have 24 hours to act, and the fine structure that applies to a uh, failure to get it right uh, is enormous, even at the scale of uh, revenues and profits that the major platforms uh, enjoy these days. Uh, 50 million euros uh, can be the penalty for getting it wrong. And so, of course, the platforms have begun to massively over uh, uh, takedown. They uh, are, are um, uh, striking down speech from elected politicians that sit in the Bundestag because uh, they touch on issues of race or immigration or uh, edge their way into um, what somebody might consider to be um, hateful speech. So um, the problem, I think, that, that, that confronts uh, Germany's effort is that there are sort of two related uh, mistakes that the uh, German uh, government has made. One is to have the wrong standards, in other words, by our uh, uh, lights as, as uh, 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 children of the First Amendment, uh, rules that um, uh, 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 prohibit uh, wide swaths of speech that, that, that should properly be seen as uh, part of the rough and tumble of public debate. So the substantive rules are very overbroad. And then secondly, they have assigned as a decision maker the platforms themselves. Um, and so uh, what I fear is going to happen is that now uh, the government's uh, becoming aware of all sorts of uncomfortable acts of blocking that are taking place. And instead of um, uh, separating these two things, they will simply say, well, uh, the platforms are, 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 are overbroad in what they're taking down, so we will shift the decision maker uh, to a government body or some kind of a government agency, and then we'll have bad standards and, uh, and an equally bad or even worse decision maker uh, making those calls, in my judgment, uh, rather than trying to fix the standards and fix uh, the decision maker in different ways. One just to, like footnote, I just have to raise this example because it's, it's just super fun. When I, um, when I teach law school classes these days, it's kind of comparative constitutionalism. So I, we look at different free speech clauses around the world and then how it plays out in reality. A really interesting case um, 
related to New York Times, uh, or touching on New York Times against Sullivan, uh, 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 emerged in the early 1990s in India, where, so in the, in the US, you have this very uh, uh, curt little constitutional clause, Congress shall make no law respecting abridgment of speech, and yet we've come up with lots of laws that, that, that can be made respecting an abridgment of speech. Um, and in India, they've got a 400-page constitution, 444 different articles, um, and they've got a, a free speech clause that basically runs on three pages where the first sentence says, we uh, you know, enshrine uh, the uh, protection of freedom of expression, except for, and then there's page after page of exception. <laughs> so what's interesting, though, is that the lower level courts in India, starting in the late 80s and 90s, when it became evident that public officials were using libel and defamation law as instruments of oppression and sort of political advantage, they began to percolate up through their decisions uh, the recognition, citation to, and then substantive importation of the New York Times against uh, Sullivan type standards in order to, um, to sort of deal with that. And so you end up with this kind of like convergence where a rule that comes from a very different constitutional architecture and starting point and uh, another, uh, uh, a, a very different starting point, have sort of converged in the middle, bubbling up from, uh, from the trial court level all the way up to the Indian Supreme Court, which by the way, if you read the case that involves a gangster named Otto Shankar. It's a totally fascinating case, unbelievably procedurally uh, convoluted because it involved a gangster who had been imprisoned. He wrote an autobiography. A newspaper got their hands on it. The jailers were afraid they were going to look bad. They forced him to ask it for it to be taken down. The newspaper brought an affirmative suit to get it declared that they could publish the whole thing. Super weird. But anyway, the Indian Supreme Court's uh, citation of that uh, decision in their case is basically like wrong in a way that you would give a F2 in a constitutional law exam. But uh, they still mentioned it uh, and so instantiated in Indian law. So anyway, the second thing that I, I want to mention, looking at my clock here, I think I have just enough time to do this, um, is from the platform perspective, um, the, the kind of ditch that these platforms find themselves in now is similarly that they're confronting a lot of fake speech. They do not want to be uh, sort of purveyors of libelous and defam uh, defamatory speech. Um, and so they run these you know, huge operations of user support and kind of like reactive um, uh, efforts to take speech down. They are also investing heavily in machine learning to try to detect this stuff when it's going on. But of course, you know, uh, libel is essentially undetectable as a matter of you know, computer algorithms. So they're trying. But wh where they find themselves now is Countries like Germany are coming along and saying, OK, the legal binary that has applied to uh, the big speech platforms uh, for now almost 20 years is one where either we view you as a neutral pipe, analogous to a phone company, where you know, if two criminals plan a crime using the telephone, you don't indict the phone company, or you're an editorial publisher and therefore responsible for what happens on your platform because you have had control and you have exercised some degree of uh, control uh, over the speech itself. Um, and so uh, yeah, something like the Facebook news feed is neither of those things, right? So the news feed, uh, which is the core of the Facebook product, is a selection algorithm for choosing which things you will see. And so that direction of attention operates at a scale of generally like about 1,000 to 20. So a typical user with, say, 500 friends will have 1,000 candidate posts that he or she could see. And even a heavy user might only see like 30, 40, 50 posts of you know, scrolling like this all day long. So it's that narrowing of 1,000 things to 20, which is the essence of the product. And so that is not neutral pipe. They're definitely making choices about what kinds of things you should, should see, some of which are algorithmically determined, some of which are based on the business objectives of the company. If they have a new photo product, you'll see more photos. If they have a new partnership with the Wall Street Journal, you'll see more journal articles, maybe. Um, but it's also not being an editorial controller. And so to me, the interesting sort of like um, effort at the moment it, uh, should be to try to figure out how to define uh, that middle category so that the companies can exercise some degree of responsibility, either substantively or mechanically, um, uh, and uh, ward off the pressure to just get them regulated as publishers, which is what we see sort of Germany doing. Um, and I'll just say finally, um, I uh, don't have any brilliant ideas for how to handle this. Um, I am very interested in mechanisms uh, like the ones that uh, Mike mentioned, which is to say expedited fact-finding and adjudication in some kind of a fashion which is independent of the platform. Uh, I don't know if it would fully comply 
uh, with uh, Professor Reddish's requirements for an administrative, uh, st uh, proper administrative state, but um, some kind of decision maker which is independent of the platforms, independent of the speakers, can do the due diligence on the validity of court orders when they exist, can do independent fact finding when it's appropriate. Um, I like the UDRP, which I, I helped design uh, with Mike and others, but it's a pretty clunky mechanism. It doesn't actually uh, you know, produce great results in a lot of cases. The one thing that I am sure is that it would be a huge mistake to let Germany be the lead country to figure this out. Probably the same thing is true for the US, at least in the Trump administration, uh, for the reasons that Stuart Taylor outlined earlier. But, um, but I do think this is an area for um, uh, relatively urgent uh, action by the academy and by policymakers to figure out some way for us to really deal with intentional falsehood, which we should, I think, accept as a, as a, as a problem, um, and build a mechanism which doesn't uh, fall afoul of the convoluted incentives of the platforms, the interjurisdictional conflicts, and the um, uh, danger of massively overbroad substantive requirements that could be imposed. Thank you. Before we give Eugene a, a chance to respond, uh, Mike tapped me near the end of, of Andrew's presentation saying that that what Andrew was getting at was uh, struck you as a case that you've seen. Yes, yeah, so, so we actually have a case that's a model for a third way. Uh, uh, Andrew uh, says that there were, you know, the choice is either are you kind of like a common carrier or a neutral platform, or are you in some way responsible for the content? If that is that correct? Do I have that right? It's yeah, really. I mean, it's, I mean kind of, there's, that's, there's copyright and trademark. Sure, 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 sure. But, you know, but generally speaking, generally speaking. Generally that's the speaking. Um, so, so we broke that binary uh, more than 25 years ago, and then we forgot that we fixed the problem. Uh, there was a 1991 case called Cubby versus CompuServe. Uh, it's a federal case. Uh, it never uh, rose above the district court level, uh, but, but it was hugely influential because it was the first of its kind and it involved, uh, as you can guess, CompuServe. Uh, CompuServe was a forum which had a lot of people participating. It was a company, but the people were originating their own content. And the question was, should CompuServe be held liable for uh, the content that they were publishing? And they were not a common carrier. So for example, if you, were, if you post on CompuServe and you were posting in a forum that you violated the rules of the forum or you violated uh, terms of service, they could ban you. But the question is, does that make them a publisher for the purposes of traditional libel law liability? And the answer Judge Leisure said, in this case, federal case, Cubby versus CompuServe, was we have another model in First Amendment law, which is the bookstore model. And it turns out that Smith versus California, uh, a case, uh, an obscenity case, as it turns out, uh, held that a bookstore was not liable for the contents of every book. Because if, if you've ever run a bookstore, you know that you have not read every book in the bookstore. Yet, you have read some of the books in the bookstore, but the fact that you read some of the books in the bookstore doesn't mean that you're liable for all of the books in the bookstore in terms of content. And um, that model was understood uh, and had been understood for uh, decades of cases to be a third model where you exercise some selectivity as to general content. So you could run a science fiction bookstore for example, but not have read every science fiction book. And if there's libel in the science fiction book, you're not responsible. That case was out there. So why don't we use those cases today? And why don't we promulgate those cases in international forums as well, where typically the model is a choice between strict publisher, or not strict pu liability, but traditional publisher liability or common carriage? And the answer is we, we truncated the development of the common law in the United States with the passage of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So now, with Section 230 was designed to recreate in statute the kind of balances that had been struck in uh, Cubby versus CompuServe. And, the re and so nowadays, if you talk to internet lawyers, almost always in America, in the United States, we begin with Section 230, and we begin with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, 1996, 1998, and we forget that there was a common law tradition so why was that section, so section 230, I happen to know, because I was here and played a role in this happening. Section 230 arose because of another case that happened a couple of years after Cubby versus CompuServe called uh, Prodigy versus Stratton Oakmont. Or Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy. Now, if Stratton Oakmont sounds familiar, those are the wolves of Wall Street. The Wolves of Wall Street uh, won a case against Prodigy, uh, and Prodigy unwisely chose not to litigate it further. Uh, and in that case, the judge misconstrued Cubby versus CompuServe as requiring exactly what Andrew said, 
choice between a, a common, carrier mo common carrier model or traditional publisher model. And because of the confusion that case created, there was an impulse to add Section 230 to the Communications Decency Act. And that's how we got Section 230. So now I've unpacked a whole little footnote here. But the fact is, we do have a common law, constitutional law tradition that we can still reach back to in terms of a third way. And we should use it internationally as well. They have bookstores internationally. So, uh, Andrew or Eugene, do you have any thoughts on that before we? So I actually want to elaborate that. <clears throat> partly because it's a very interesting conceptual point, and partly because I have, I've gotten into always looking for the most lurid possible examples, because that's what sticks in people's mind. I have an excellent example of this. So first, let me just stress again what Mike is saying, because this is a really important understanding, both the way things could be done in libel, the way things are done as to copyright and trademark in, in many respects, especially copyright. There are three models. One is the common carrier. Indeed, the telephone company cannot be sued for libel. There actually were cases on this issue, for example, where the, the telephone company provided some sort of answering machine, uh, um, or provided a phone line that somebody used to have a, an answering machine with an outgoing message that was libelous. So there, the phone company could have just cut off service, but the view was it shouldn't have to. Another example of a common carrier is the public street. The city owns the street, but the city is not going to be held liable for defamatory comments on the street, even ones that are sort of visible because they're picketing, pickets. Now, under First Amendment law, the city can't even restrict that, but in any event, it doesn't have to. The other side is the traditional publisher, like the newspaper, which is liable for everything it publishes, including letters to the editor. And it's liable as if it's their own work, maybe subject to some actual malice protections and such, but uh, in any event, liable for what it publishes. And in between is the model of the bookstore. The library, in theory, would be liable for this, too. And my favorite case involves, involves the, the tavern. And this is a 1952 California case. Uh, the respondents were proprietors of a public tavern and maintained a toilet room for men on the wall of which there appeared libelous matter indicating that appellant, one Isabel Hellar, uh, was an unchaste woman who indulged in illicit amateur ventures. You might gather that was not in quotes uh, in the opinion. Uh, I am quoting the opinion accurately. They, they did not quote specific statements, but they did say the, the writer recommended that anyone interested should call a stated telephone number, which was the number of the telephone in appellant's home, and quote, ask for Isabel, close quote. In any event, the court held that the tavern had a duty to take this down. Now, it didn't suggest that the tavern would be strictly liable for things posted on the walls by their customers, nor did it even suggest that it had a duty to be constantly monitoring. But it was an early example of a notice and takedown regime. Uh, so, so that is definitely a model. The problem with that is what I think of as the Scientology problem. So I give a Scientology as an example of an organization that is, at the very least, let's say, is heavily criticized, and I think with good reason, and is known to be quite litigious. That if Scientologists ha can take advantage of a notice and takedown regime, they will notice all sorts of things, uh, all very often. And there will be this asymmetric pressure of the sort that Andrew identified on these third parties to take the stuff down. So that was the insight of Section 230 is notice and takedown is too restrictive. It's better than the publisher model, uh, but it's even better than the bookstore model, the notice and takedown model, the one we use for copyright law, because uh, in practice, the notice and takedown model uh, will give too much incentive for people to take stuff down. And whether or not that was the right decision, given some of the consequences that have flowed, that is the question before us, one of the questions before us. Andrew, did you have any thoughts on this? No, I just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just um, say, uh, right. Like, so, so a notice and takedown system uh, can work awfully well. Um, we've got a lot of experience with how to make them work. The question from the platform side is always, what notices from, from whom? Uh, and under what circumstances do you take it down? Currently, uh, they, and I, I, I used to run parts of Tumblr and Medium as well on the business side, you know, you'd have to invest in teams of people to go and basically do the kind of legal analysis you would expect a law clerk uh, in a judge's chambers to do. Or well, and not only that, but you'd actually have to do the fact investigation. 
The problem is that even more so than with copyright law, whether something is libelous or not depends on facts that are extrinsic to the post. Right. Uh, and so it's not clear to me how they could be expected to do this investigation in any serious way unless the, the sense is, the presumption is, take when in doubt, take it down. And you'll almost always be in doubt. That's right, right. Let me just, just go ahead. Let me just, and just to say, the, 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 a good counterexample, if you look across the kind of like mm -hmm. spectrum of approaches of the platforms, is Twitter's view is basically, you know, we don't take anything down unless we absolutely feel that we're legally compelled to do so. They take a pretty hard line on that. In other words, a, a formal court order, they don't do fact investigation. They don't go out and kind of discretion. Right, but, but because they're down. not subject to notice and take down regime. That's right, exactly, and exactly right. And so, so, so you see Facebook uh, and YouTube taking a lot down discretionarily because they think it's the right thing to do, right. with or without some degree right. of fact investigation. Right. So, so let me just let, let me just so clarify my thinking on this. I, I want to be really clear that the bookstore model is not a notice and takedown regime. Uh, the tavern case is not a notice and takedown regime. If if you are running a bookstore and somebody, uh, some author whose book you carry has, uh, or their publisher has lost a libel case, that does not it does not automatically follow that if you have not removed the book from your shelves, you are therefore you know sub, at least potentially liable for for libel or or whatever else uh, re, whatever other reason the book might have been uh, uh, awarded a judgment against it. So, well, when, it's, it's when very, I, I'm just going to be really clear about this. That is not a notice and takedown oh, regime. Okay. Notice and takedown really originates uh, uh, with primarily with the copyright holders and the and, and the other and other intellectual property interests that r argue not unreasonably that uh, if you're a trademark holder and your trademark is constantly infringed, it's dilution, and you have a, a lot of duties under the law to protect that. If you're a copyright holder, uh, there's some similar law. But also, the theory was that in the digital age, because Copying, the cost of incremental copying was so lowered uh, that you needed a takedown regime in order to be properly fast and responsive. That is not the common law solution uh, that's embodied in Cubby versus CompuServe and that's talked about in the Stratton Oakmont case. That, that, that's, you know, there's no notice and takedown in those cases. I want to be really clear about that. So I do, I do, want, I do want to ask yeah. a question though. Okay. Um, uh, we'll cease and assist this for a second. Let me just ask you a question. You said at the end of your presentation you didn't have a solution. I don't. Which, which I take to mean you don't have a great solution or even a good solution. Is there a least worst solution? I mean, all the things you've surveyed, which is the one that's the, 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 the most so effective? So I am sympathetic to uh, injunctions in libel cases uh, that Although I would prefer, in part because I want to be as speech protective as possible, or as little speech protective as possible, for them to be written as follows. Uh, not, you cannot say anything defamatory about plaintiff, because that has all of the chilling effect that criminal libel law does. Because and you're afraid you're going to go, go to jail because something that you think is true ultimately is proved to be false, even subject to the actual malice standard. Um, uh, nor do I think it is enough, though, to say you cannot re say again that the defendant molested uh, uh, children, mm -hmm. uh, as in one of the cases there. Because then you don't get proof beyond a reasonable doubt that that's false. You don't get a lawyer, necessarily, to represent you in that case, because it's a civil case. Um, rather, the injunction should be you cannot falsely say then, and then the specific statement that is uh, 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 that, that is found to be defamatory. That gets the, the speaker, although maybe not the plaintiff, the best of both worlds. On the one hand, it's, an, it's nice and narrow, so the speaker knows what he can't say. On the other hand, because there's a requirement of falsehood, if the speaker really is confident that, that it's true, the speaker can violate the, or not, excuse me, cannot violate the injunction, can speak without violating the injunction, because then a trial, should he wish to be to, to take it to trial, he will have a criminal lawyer appointed to represent him, and the, play, the prosecution or, uh, would, or, or the court, let, whatever, whoever is enforcing the contempt of court uh, citation, would have to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the statement actually was false, rather than just by preponderance of the evidence. No. Uh, but then one might ask, if you have that, Maybe criminal libel isn't such a bad solution, at least if limited to speech and matters of private concern, though I should flag that I think courts do a lousy job of distinguishing speech and matters of public concern for private concern. 
uh, on the th uh, and that you know criminal libel law has never been held unconstitutional. In fact, the court has reaffirmed that properly limited it's constitutional. Maybe that's fine. Let me just ask a brief follow up and then let Andrew mm -hmm. jump in on this. You know, the, one of the downsides to the injunction centric approach that you, you had was just the problem of fake injunctions, fake court, court documents. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. That's why I'm I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Um, but, but I'm curious how much of, of the problem of, of inauthentic fraudulent documents will end up getting solved by, by blockchain and distributed ledger? I mean, will, will technology solve that aspect well, of the problem? You, so th there are, there are th three kinds of problems with these injunctions. One is the outright forgery. You do not need exotic technologies to solve it. <laughs> what you need is you need to have courts that have websites, maybe even some federated website, onto which anybody <coughs> who gets this order can easily go and say, I want to go and check. Mm -hmm. This is how I found all these forgeries, by checking. Now, it turns out that many courts don't have their stuff online, uh, although oddly, uh, a lot of the forgeries, the forgers didn't seem to mind the, 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 that it could so easily be checked. Uh, some of them, it's really hard to get online. Some of them, it's expensive. But you could solve that problem uh, uh, um, uh, just by having kind of really reliable uh, reference mechanisms this way. The second problem, though, is lawsuits against fake defendants, lawsuits against, against real defendants who lie about whether they, uh, about th they're having a connection, they're being the authors, it turns out they're not, the authors are not related. Uh, default judgments where there is no real attempt to go after the person. And then that kind of authenticity checking, whether it's blockchain or anything else, isn't gonna help. But note that the, those problems don't really happen when you're trying to enforce things directly against the speaker. Mm -hmm. Because then the defendant could say, well, I was never served, or uh, I'm not, uh, uh, um, or if you have, a, if you have a, a forged court order against the non-existent defendant, you have nobody you can enforce it against. Right. All of that f fraud uh, works only because it's being submitted to a third party. Uh, but the problem is if you, if you avoid third party enforcement and stick with the injunctions, what do you do against somebody who really is anonymous? What do you do against uh, somebody who's out of the jurisdiction and the like? One last thing I do want to say, I think that the bookstore and such and the, uh, the tavern model is notice and take down. It's yeah, plainly wrong. So here's why I think that's so. Well, really what's briefly, because I do want to give Andrew a chance and then we'll do that's audience okay. questions. Let's have this fight and then I'll so, go back to mine. What's the consequence? of being in the bookstore box. It's once you are informed, you don't have to read all of the books, that's right, but once you're informed uh, to a point generally where a reasonable person would know, although maybe it's a knowledge-based thing, uh, but, but uh, once you're informed that this is libelous, uh, then at that point you, point, you are on the hook if you don't take it. I, I, I know you've, you've worked very hard to make the toilet case just like the bookstore cases, uh, but in fact, there is, that is not how the case law has ever been read uh, in a decision. Uh, that is a 1952 case, by the way. It predates virtually all of the modern structure of defamation law, and uh, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, it's, uh, it, it has no effect on, on either the current understanding of defamation law or the bookstore model or the pre-Section uh, 230 cases. So it's interesting, I mean, it is kind of interesting that there's a tavern, uh, a tavern defamation case, tavern bathroom defamation case out there. But I will say that tavern, uh, uh, tavern uh, uh, bathrooms are not really uh, the same as bookstores. And I'm just gonna consent you to insist that the function of a tavern bathroom is so fundamentally different from a, fundam from a bookstore that analogizing them is not going to lead you to good legal reasoning. Well, so oh. I just use it because it's fun, but there are bookstores, bo there's a comment in the restatement of torts, restatement right. second of torts section 5881 right. comment D that specifically says that the distributor who's not a republic such as a bookstore is liable is not liable if it quote neither knows nor has reason to know of the defamatory article close quote right but, but that right right but 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 scienter is, remember that this is exactly yeah. the the issue that was at the center of cubby versus CompuServe, which is whether CompuServe could be presumed to have uh, scienter as to the content that was defamatory and they don't and the bill and the and the and the case uh, leads back to smith versus california uh, an obscenity case involving a bookstore, and I urge you all not to take my word for it, but to just retrace the actual scholarship of actual cases, 
And you will see that, in fact, amazingly, bookstores are not perceived as being just like bathrooms. Well, now I'm curious about what happens when there's a def defamatory statement in the restroom of a bookstore. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. While well, we ponder that, Andrew, did you want to jump in? Well, I just wanted to. I, <laughs> um, uh, just a footnote. Uh, so, so. Um, uh, I just have to opine that it's a disgrace that the U.S. courts uh, system's PACER system is still behind a paywall mm -hmm. and makes it very difficult to get information and documents out. Uh, it publishes them in a proprietary document format called PDF. It's a whole headache. If the U.S. court system put all of its filings and information in public in a machine-readable, standardized way, then blockchain, schmock chain, we would just uh, you know, be able to verify these things much more easily. Um, uh, I, I was just going to uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, say... Now let me go back to my note. What was my earlier comment? Uh, no, I'm going to leave it there. Let's go to audience questions then. Uh, we'll start over here on the left, and then are there other hands? And then the second one will be right here. Eugene, um, I would urge you, if you come up with a solution here, to move more towards the injunction angle than the criminal libel angle. The criminal libel angle really scares me because the, the incentive for government more often than not, I fear, would be intimidation of political opponents. Uh, where a private individual is suing because he or she was, was injured, the motivations are different. But I think putting that power in the hands of, of a government is potentially uh, very intimidating and chilling on speech that's critical. So I appreciate your point, and the, the, I'm not one who's eager to see criminalization of speech. Um, this having been said, I will say from my very tentative and not complete review, just because I haven't gotten all of the court records yet, with the exception of two Louisiana cases, which actually didn't ultimately lead to a criminal libel actual persecution. They were kind of, they were attempts to use the criminalization of this as ways of, of getting search warrants, in part because Louisiana law, criminal libel law, has been read very narrowly. Apart from those, the others involve stuff that looks quite apolitical. Uh, and I'm sorry, so, but I just wanted to add one other thing, and I, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your further feedback. If I look at the injunctions, I see more injunctions where the plaintiff is some political figure or some uh, important kind of local worthy who goes to court, gets the injunction, probably gets the injunction in part because he has the ear of the local judge. Sometimes the plaintiff is a local judge and then gets an injunction, which is actually much broader, some of these injunctions are, than, uh, than the speech restrictive force of the criminal libel statute. Uh, so, in principle, I appreciate your point, but in practice, it doesn't look like the injunction system is less likely to be politicized than the criminal law. Well, your, your answer um, raised uh, satellite questions about the constitutional neutrality of, of, and independence of state judges. But putting that, that, as, that aside, you said you only had 20 cases. 20 cases per year. Per year, and two of them that you found were uh, politically driven, that's right. 10%. If this is used more broadly and it's right. not 20 cases, we're talking in an absolute amount considerably more even if, if it right. just replicates right. that. Of the percentage. ones that I have seen, and there's more than 20 because it's 20 per year, I've probably seen enough data on at least 50 plus. I've seen basically two that are that way. And you're right, that's a considerable percentage, but again, if that's your concern, the injunctions, which again are enforceable through the force of criminal law, are no better. The, for the injunctions, based on my admittedly very narrow sample, at least as high a percentage, and probably a higher percentage, uh, uh, involves people using this process in order to suppress political criticism. But, but there's a clear distinction. With the injunction, you are told what you had said was libelous and defamatory, and you are put on notice. If it's a criminal situation, you know, feel lucky punk, you, 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 when you say it, you don't know if it's going to be considered libelous, so it's the classic New York Times chilling effect. Oh, so well, right, there is, a, there is a somewhat higher chilling effect for that, although an injunction that says stop saying libelous things, which is a common form of injunction, would indeed have that same chilling effect. That may be reason to avoid that injunction. Let me just, uh, let's take the next question, and then are there other hands? Anybody else have a question? Okay, and then next one. Uh, hi, Harry Hetchison. Uh, I'm director of policy for the American Center for Law and Justice. And I just have a very 
short question, Andrew, concerning the German law and your understanding of it in terms of its reach. So I'm very, very curious um, because we do some international work. So let's assume I'm in Germany. I hear a politician making an offensive statement. Someone uh, goes to Google. They are now required to take it down. Um, so let's assume that statement is now repeated in the United States, or let's assume it's repeated in an amicus brief before the Supreme Court. Would uh, the German uh, ruling um, or rules prevent Google from disseminating that information, let's say, in the United States or anywhere else in the world? So. Um so uh, the short answer is unclear. There's a major fight going on right now about extra uh, the extraterritoriality of European uh, 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 speech restrictions. Um, so uh, it is clear that Germany's view would be that uh, Google must block it if, if, if uh, put on notice and, uh, and it falls within one of those 20 categories of obviously illegal speech, then it's Google's responsibility to block it within Germany. Uh, there are fights, however, um, uh, in the right to be forgotten realm in particular, about whether European, either privacy driven or national substantive speech limitation driven uh, takedowns have to be uh, enforced globally. And so the French Data Protection Authority has taken the view that things taken down under the right to be forgotten in France must be taken down globally. Um, and uh, we will get some insight uh, into the you, Supreme Court's take on that case, most likely in a case involving um, uh, uh, surveillance uh, requests from uh, uh, to Microsoft, whether it has to turn over to U.S. law enforcement authorities data held by uh, Microsoft about Europeans in Europe, um, and so maybe that'll shed some light on on general trends in extraterritoriality. So, so let me just supplement that a little bit. I was general counsel for uh, a few years at, uh, for Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is a global uh, uh, resource that's available in many languages. And uh, uh, there were, over the course of my tenure and certainly since then, uh, many efforts internationally to suppress content, uh, you know, either in English or in other or in other languages. One of the uh, one of the elegant solutions uh, that we were able to implement that a company like Google or or any other international company could not, even though Wikipedia is international, is that we hosted so much. We made sure to put so much of our infrastructure within the United States, so that everyone essentially had to come into a U.S. forum if they had a content uh, uh, issue. Uh, that, is, that solution, uh, unfortunately, does not scale, uh, sadly, uh, because I, otherwise everybody, every American company would be doing just that. Uh, but it, it, is, it is, in some ways, the right decision, decision to rely on jurisdictional firewalls. But having said that, what I, what I think is a perfectly fundable project, if I, if I wanted to start another project, I would uh, create a right to be forgotten database within the United States in which all I did was post uh, uh, the decisions and documents for every right to be forgotten case published in any language anywhere. And then I would host it out of the United States and uh, I'd make sure that it was indexable and I would do everything I could possibly do to make sure it was findable and uh, let the chips fall where they may. I have a lot of issues with right to be forgotten. Right. But I take it the problem would be that if Google really is bound by these things, then they would have to... Google can de-index, but uh, de -index. Then, I, then I use the Streisand effect to defeat Google's de-indexing. But if Google de ends up de-indexing everybody who tries to do the Streisand effect... I no, mean, no, you really, you know, th this problem has been anticipated and answered, and I think the way you, s you see it is in uh, social media in the People's Republic of China where uh, 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 Chinese users, partly because they have a language that's very uh, dense in written form and can be elusive and metaphorize and do a bunch of things that allude to the content without actually saying it, uh, can do a lot to defeat uh, machine-based algorithmic censorship. So even if you delist uh, everything that says something bad about a particular person by name, you can allude to that person, and it's still known what, what, what you want to say about them. But if the person's, if our concern is that we want to, by searching for a person's name, reliably and quickly get information about Right, right. 
then then that would be that ability, searchability would be defeated no, by no, a Google obligation. Believe me, there's a whole there, there's some literature on this, and 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 uh, especially with regard to uh, 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 countries that have censorship regimes, including the People's Republic of China, in in terms of innovative social uh, based solutions to this. And and I don't pretend that the solutions are perfect, but it turns out that the impulse to defeat censorship is actually quite human and almost universal. Okay. Last question, Mike uh, Mike Riva. Um, Mike Reaver, <laughs> Antonin Scalia Law School. I know nothing about libel law. If the bookstore model is not notice and takedown, what exactly is it? What exactly are they liable for? If you could hum a few more bars and where the, where the analogies between bookstores and platforms might or might not so, break, so break down. For one thing, notice and takedown. So notice and takedown as a remedy is really about pulling down the content that's that is offensive or illegal or is subject of a judgment or the subject of a process that is uh, embodied in a notice and takedown regime. Notice and takedown is notably pretty narrow. Libel law has not been about. Look at law. You have legal remedies. At equity, you have equitable remedies. And pulling down is an equitable remedy. Uh, and Oh, damages is the legal remedy. So typically, so in the law, in, in defamation cases, you typically have judgments that involve money. You may have injunctions, and there are questions about, as, as Eugene appropriately raises, about you know uh, injunctions as a kind of private criminal law when you don't obey the court order. But the fact is, the primary remedy has always been money, and it's why libel law tr traditionally involved rich people suing uh, uh, rich defendants. Eugene, do you have a word in closing? Well, sure, just to answer the question about notice and takedown, the restatement tells us, and by the way, the, the very, very few cases actually apply this, perhaps because bookstores didn't usually keep books on the shelves after being threatened with this or whatever else. There was a case, Spence v. Flint, and I believe it is the Flint, uh, which, which applied this. But the rule is that a bookshop is not liable if there are no facts or circumstances known to him, a bookseller, which would suggest to him as a reasonable man that a particular book contains matter which he would recognize as defamatory. So there's, that's why he needs notice. Uh, but if a particular, uh, but actually, if, if a particular author has frequently published notoriously sensational or scandalous books, then the bookster may be seen as being unnoticed. But I take it, and this was so in Spence v. Flint, a fortiori it would be so if the bookstore owner had been specifically notified. So now it's true that it's not notice and takedown in the sense that notice is the equivalent of an injunction. But it is notice and takedown in the sense that it is often understood in copyright law, which is if you host something on your site and I notify you that it violates uh, copyright law, then you at best take it down or you lose your safe harbor. So, so, right. so no, you could no. be sued for damages. And to the extent that courts have begun to allow injunctions, and most courts that have considered allow narrow injunctions uh, in, in libel cases, it would also allow injunctions. But in any event, it's a notice and takedown regime that if you get notice, you had best take it down or else face the consequences. So, 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 we are, so we're up against our time. Right. I want to say, Andrew, do you have a final word in closing? No. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We'll take a 15-minute break and be back at the halftime.